Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Across the world, people are asking what is going on? Why is the world in such a mess? Pandemics, famine, earthquakes, lawlessness, freak weather and the breakdown of society. Is this the work of the Antichrist? The Antichrist, who is he? Where does he come from? Is he here already? Is it President Obama? Or perhaps President Trump? People have speculated for generations, was it Nero? Or Hitler? Or even Bill Gates? How will we know? What does the Bible tell us? Today Jacob looks at what scripture tells us, and reminds us of what we have always known from the Bible itself. So stay tuned for today's lesson, from Jacob Prash on Morial TV, with, 8 Important Signs of the Antichrist. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you from Morial Ministries on RTN TV. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, in my book, Shadows of the Beast, we deal extensively with the issue of how the identity of the Antichrist is going to be revealed to the faithful church. We deal with this at length, looking at everything from history to <clears throat> exegetical context to typology. But as present events unfold, it's good to do periodic updates and look at how what's transpiring now is lining up with what the Word of God said is going to happen concerning the Antichrist. You know, we've for some time, along with many other Christians, been looking at a number of issues. Among these issues that we've looked at are global debt, the environment, homosexuality and the acceptance of it virtually by people in the gospel coalition or compromise with it, refusal to say it's wrong by people like Carl Linz or Beth Moore or Tim Keller or even people who will sanction it such as Steve Chalk in the UK or Tony Campolo essentially or so it would appear. Of course, Moloch worship, non-therapeutic abortion, the sacrifice of babies to demonic powers in order to bring financial prosperity, abortion as an industry. Obviously, the prevalence of theocratic politics, and not least of all, postmodernism. These and other issues all herald the fact that we're approaching the last days, or we are in the last days. And as we've said a number of times, contemporary events in the Middle East, the fact that the Jews are back in their land and in their ancient capital, and that they're beginning to come to faith again in their own Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. This makes this time in history very different from the other times in history when true believers thought it was the last days. Arguably, many of these signs did seem to be taking place, and of course, many sincere believers thought they were in the last days at other times in history. But Israel was not reborn yet as a nation, and Jews were not yet returning to Christ. Multiple passages address these two issues, such as Luke 21, 24, Zechariah chapter 12, Matthew chapter 23, verse 39, and Romans chapter 11. Be that as it may, what I'd like to look at today are eight signs unfolding in present world developments, eight signs of the time of the Antichrist drawing near. Now, I'm not saying it's around the corner or next week or next month. I don't know when it is. I would certainly not be surprised if he's alive or that the two beasts of Revelation 13 are alive. Maybe I would be surprised if they weren't, but I'm certainly not going to be surprised if they are. What I am saying is, the events of recent months even, certainly the last few years, are more and more acutely pointing to the manifestation of the Antichrist. As we've taught many times, based on various passages of Scripture, such as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, Revelation 13, etc. The identity of the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, must be known to the faithful church before the parousia, before the rapture and resurrection, before the return of Christ. Be that as it may, let's look at these eight contemporary signs of the advent of the Antichrist drawing nearer, dressed in what is happening in today's news in light of prophecy. One of which, turn with me please to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12. Verse 3, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard, spiker nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now there is a deep spiritual meaning in that symbolism in itself, or the symbolism of that literal event. Nonetheless, let's look at verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box. He used to pill for what was put into it. Well, that's what it says in John. Now let's consider it synoptically. It's in Matthew, but it's also in Mark chapter 14. Look with me, please, to the 14th chapter of Mark's gospel. Verse 3. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why was this perfume wasted? For well, this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. When we read in Matthew, it was not just some of the disciples, it was seemingly most of them, or all of them. But it begins with Judas, Yehuda Iscariot. Remember, Judas is a major picture of the Antichrist. They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. The Apostle John, describes the Antichrist in the character of Judas, going out from among us. He is the only one of the 12 apostles who was not a Galilean. He was from Judea by birth, as was Jesus. He and Jesus were from Judea by birth. The others were all Galileans. He tries to look like Jesus the most in terms of his background and so forth and his identity. Nonetheless, they went out from among us. Both Judas and the Antichrist, we are told, are very much into money and financial power. Thirdly, they are both called the son of perdition, the son of perdition, and they're the only two characters who are. Additionally, while many people have been demon-possessed, both in scripture and throughout the ages, and today, there have always been the demonically possessed. Only Judas and the Antichrist are called Satan possessed, and Satan entered him. He's satanically possessed. Well, when you see something about Judas, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something about the Antichrist to come. I'd refer you to my book, Shadows of the Beast. We examine this at much greater depth and length. Be that as it may, let's understand what Judas did. He ingratiated himself to the other disciples. He made himself look good, righteous, holy, by pretending to care about the poor. He had a very effective message of social consciousness, of care for the disenfranchised, 
for the poor. Now that is overtaking secular society today in the same hypocritical way. Not to make a political statement, but we know the reality. This is the week of the history of Selma, Alabama, as one news commentator pointed out. And I remember what happened in Sel Selma, Alabama in my youth. The Democratic Party dominated the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, all members of the Ku Klux Klan were Democrats. The Democratic Party was the party of slavery and after that of Jim Crow and segregation. Blacks struggled for the right to vote in Selma, Alabama, and after very violent confrontations with the police and so forth, they eventually got it. But they voted for Democrats, the same party that oppressed them. Now again, I'm only stating that by way of historical fact, not as a political campaign issue. Well, Today, Selma, Alabama has a 40% unemployment rate. The black community is absolutely poverty-stricken, worse than it has ever been. This is what happened in Selma, Alabama. You look at cities where people claim to care about the poor the most. Detroit, Baltimore, Philadelphia, St. Louis, wherever the political left has had the most power and control, the poor have had it the worst and have done for decades. The more they talk about the poor, the less they care about the poor. That is a fact. Things do not get better. Things get worse, but they never improve with the poor, with these people who run on political platforms caring, pretending to care about them. The same as the, the, the women's issues and the... the women's rights and women's equality. Tribute was paid this week to Ted Kennedy as a hero for women's rights. Well, tell that to Mary Jo Kopechny. He didn't even report the fact that she drowned in his automobile till the next morning. He was the Harvey Weinstein, as someone pointed out, of politics. It's all hypocrisy. It's complete hypocrisy. <laughs> Hollywood liberals, Harvey Weinstein, a big funder of the Democratic Party. The more they talk about women's rights, the less they care about women's rights. The more they talk about the rights of blacks, the less they care about the rights of blacks. It's always been like that. George Washington Carver warned that there would be black poverty crats who would build financial empires and power bases by exploiting the cause of black people in the name of civil rights. And he was right, poverty crats, racer crats. But the things ever get better for the people in Harlem or Bedford Stuyvesant or the south side of Chicago or North Philadelphia? No. Of West Baltimore? No. Of Watson, Los Angeles? No. It's all a joke. They pretend to care about the poor. Well, that's what Judas did, the son of perdition. And that's precisely what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to come with a social gospel. You now see churches propounding things like intersection, intersectionality and being woke. And these are even churches who pose themselves to be supposedly evangelical. Wokeness and intersectionality and things of this nature. They become built on a social agenda, not on a salvation message. So it is. Now, this is not to say social injustice is not a sin. It certainly is. But a bigger sin is those who exploit the plight of the poor to line their own pockets the way Judas did and the way poverty crafts and politicians do today. But that's the world. When it gets into the church, we have a real problem. Look at Jesse Jackson, a Baptist minister who built his empire on this very thing. Long before people use language like wokeness, he was doing it. Baptist minister. 
Al Sharpton, another one. But we're speaking of Jesse Jackson. He had the Rainbow Coalition to help inner city black young people. Three out of four black babies are born out of wedlock. The socioeconomic disadvantages and the predisposition of babies born out of wedlock of any race to becoming involved in the criminal justice system and of dropping out of high school graduates astronomically when there's no supportive father, when there's an absentee father. Yet Jesse Jackson, a clergyman, a Baptist clergyman, fathered a child outside of wedlock and paid an exorbitant six-figure salary to the mother, keeping it all quiet until it was discovered. He didn't care about the poor, about the, <laughs> the black people. It's all hypocrisy. These things are all hypocritical. When the world does it, it's one thing. But when the church is seduced by it, it's quite another. It simply becomes their means to power and pocket, the same as secular politicians. It's all a joke. It's all a lie. But it's something much more than that. It's what the Antichrist and false prophet are going to do. It is one of the ways the Antichrist is going to trick and seduce and deceive people into thinking he's a wonderful humanitarian. I've warned before Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I watched the documentary of her when she got the Nobel Prize. I watched it on PBS in the United States, and she made it clear. She does nothing to convert these Hindus and Muslims to faith in Christ or Christianity. She simply cleans them up and gives them a clean environment in which to die with dignity. She wants to make them better Hindus and better Muslims. What about unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God? You pick somebody up off the streets, clean them up, and send them off to hell in a laundry chute? That's your gospel? Well, that was Mother Teresa's gospel, but it's not the gospel of Jesus. There's nothing wrong with the humanitarian assistance to the poor, not by any means. Our own ministry is involved in taking care of impoverished children in the Philippines. We're building an orphanage in, Africa, uh, in uh, India. We've had works in Africa for years. Of course we're concerned with those things. But as we always say, the biggest need of a poor person is the same as the biggest need of a wealthy one. Salvation in Jesus. A social gospel is not the gospel of salvation. Socially redeeming gospels are not going to put anybody in heaven. And if they are misrepresented as the gospel, they'll put people in hell. I looked at so many organizations in the past that began right. They began as gospel preaching. World Vision being one of them. Bernardo's in England being another. Christian aid being another. All of these began as gospel preaching ministries, organizations that help the poor, but they preach second birth. They preach repentance and faith in Jesus. But the more they became involved in a social gospel, the less concerned they were with the real gospel. And then they became political to a left-wing leaning. This is certainly true of World Vision. I don't even consider these organizations to be scripturally Christian anymore. They're not preaching the real gospel of Jesus. By and large, most of the Salvation Army has gone the same way. Now, these organizations began right. Well, what you see now with the wokeness and the intersectionality getting into churches, these things are indeed helping set the stage for the advent of Antichrist. It is not a coincidence that these trends are in vogue. That's the first. Let's look at another of the eight signs impending 
concerning the dawn of Antichrist. Let's look at the next one. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. He causes all, the small, the great, in verse 10, the rich and poor, the free men and slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man. His number is 666. What the mark of the beast is, we cannot be sure. The text does not say it is a digital currency. It may only be a numerically coded permit to buy and sell. But what's for sure is, with the coronavirus, there is a reluctance to handle currency, paper money, coinage, for fear of spreading infection. This was already taking place without reference to the coronavirus on airplanes. Duty-free purchases on airplanes would only be payable in credit cards or debit cards. They wouldn't accept cash payments on most airlines. This trend away from cash has been there for a while. But now, fueled by health concerns related to the COVID-19 virus pandemic, Stores are pushing away currency. I've seen people, cashiers, wearing rubber gloves to handle it and putting sprays on their hands to handle currency. It's easier just to wave or to tap a credit or debit card. Now, again, this trend was going on for some time, but it is gaining momentum exponentially. It's gaining momentum very quickly fueled by the pandemic we call COVID-19 from China. I don't say it's going to happen within a week or a month or a year, but it is pushing things in that direction. Very much so. Let's continue looking at another of these eight signs. The new apostolic Reformation. Jesus warned the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 about false apostles. And false apostles were around in the early church. And they will certainly be around in the last days. People claiming apostolic authority. We've warned about this many times. The word apostle has multiple meanings in Greek. One is simply the interpretation of the Hebrew shaliach, one who was sent. Jesus is the apostle in the epistle to the Hebrews with a definite article. All apostolic authority must come from and through him. He is the apostle. Then we have the unique case of the apostles who saw the Lord and got their doctrine from him. The 12 apostles, Paul the apostle, and possibly a few others. They had to see Jesus and get their doctrine directly from him. Paul, of course, communed with the Lord in Arabia and was somehow temporarily raptured or caught up to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians. He spoke of the Last Supper as if he were present, even though he was not physically there. He was not even saved yet, but he said, I receive from the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the night in which he was betrayed. He speaks of the Last Supper as if he was there. He had to get his doctrine directly from Jesus. There are no more apostles like that. As the Hebrew prophets were inspired to write the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the original apostles were inspired to write the New they saw the Lord. They were directly inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the New Testament, and they got their teaching from Jesus. Many of them 
had a prep school teaching from John the Baptist, Yochanan HaMatbil. There are no apostles like that. That kind of apostolic authority does not exist. But in the new apostolic reformation, we are seeing people functioning as if it does. It's almost unbelievable. Now, there have always been false apostles. There's a hyper-Pentecostal church called itself Apostolic Pentecostals who had a view of apostolic authority that amounted to heavy shepherding. Of course, the Pope in Rome lives in the apostolic palace and claims to be the heir of Peter, and since the 19th century claims that when he speaks ex cathedra from the chair of Peter, he's infallible. Again, another antichrist institution, the papacy. The vicar of Christ is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who acts vicariously in place of Jesus, not the Pope of Rome. Separate subject, I point you back to the book Shadows of the Beast. Be that as it may, with the new apostolic reformation, born-again believers are being caught up into this nonsense increasingly. There's even a messianic version of it in Israel with people like Asher Entrader and Dan Juster claiming that we need councils like Acts 15, where these new Latter-day Apostles are making decisions for the church at large based on a geographical location in Jerusalem. This is craziness, but it's a sign of the coming of Antichrist. He will indeed counterfeit the apostle, Jesus. He'll say he's the one who was sent. And the apostate church will believe it. By the apostate church, I just don't mean the Roman church or liberal Protestants or the Eastern Orthodox or cults like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. I mean much of apostate evangelicism. It's already on that route. This is another sign of the approaching advent of Antichrist, the growth of the new apostolic reformation. But let's look at another one. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation. Revelation, once again. The message of Jesus to the church of Thyatira. Verse 19, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. He has much good to say about this church in certain respects. But he goes on, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and teaches and leads my bond servants astray. So they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Of course, this is relating to an incipient transubstantiation. We have a book called The Dilemma of Laodicea, where we explain about these seven churches as a historical panorama, as well as seven literal churches that existed at the end of the first century, and as a spectrum of churches that will exist in the last days, how they correspond to seven periods. Uh, Here we agree with some dispensationalists, but I only mention this in passing. Notice it's the nature of the woman to seduce, and Jesus uses Jezebel, who seduced Israel under King Ahab, to bring the nation in the days of Elijah, Elisha, and the sons of the prophets into idolatry, false worship, the demonic. Well, this gets into the church, Jesus said. This gets into the church in Thyatira. And the people of God were misled by wrong doctrine. There is a relationship between the feminism of the world, the Jezebel spirit in the secular world, and spiritual seduction in the church. For every Jezebel, there's an Ahab, the men who let her do it and get away with it. 
And as we've said before, when there's a man who will withstand her, like Elijah, she hates him. Today they call them sexists and women haters. Well, that's what secular society does, but now it's in the church. We have women who are false teachers, false prophetesses, women who teach very serious false doctrine. Joyce Meyer being one, Beth Moore certainly being another, Paula White being another, Heidi Baker being yet another. These women teach false doctrine. And the Ahabs, their husbands, pastors of the churches, let them get away with it. And of course, the men who speak out against it are going to be despised. The way they despise the sons of the prophets, and not that I compare myself to Elisha or Elijah, but it's the same principle. If you speak out against this, they're going to hate you as well. These women want power because they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. It's emotional manipulation. It's religiosity that's emotionally charged, but it's not true spirituality. Look at what Joyce Meyer teaches. Look at some of her doctrine. She's a money preacher, among other things. Beth Moore, similarly, wouldn't say homosexuality is wrong. I've seen video footage of Heidi Baker. If you saw somebody doing that in society in a supermarket, you would think they need to be sedated and committed to a mental institution the way she was behaving. Insanity. Stacey Campbell is another. Open insanity in the way she behaves. It looks like insanity. I can't make the clinical diagnosis, but there's something wrong with an eight or nine month pregnant woman standing there vibrating and prophesying with a microphone. This is lunacy. Certainly it's spiritual lunacy. Whether they're mentally ill or not, I can't say, but I know there's something wrong spiritually and doctrinally. It's the Jezebel spirit. That's precisely what it is. When you look, some of these women are married multiple times, like Paula White. Ahab's let them get away with it. No, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. The growth of the feminism of the world, infiltrating the body of Christ, is the Jezebel spirit seducing the church. And ultimately we see the harlot church in Revelation chapters 17 and 18 become the footstool of Antichrist. Again, we're moving towards that more and more rapidly. Let's continue. The signs of the advent of Antichrist. What's next? Look at the riots taking place in cities. Again, I don't make this as a political statement, but when you look at cities and states that in the United States that are controlled by liberals and by the Democratic Party, that's where these things are happening. That's where these things are happening, where you have the radical pro-abortion, radical pro-homosexual agenda. This is where you have the radical breakdown of law and order. Weeks and weeks, a couple of months of riots in Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Minneapolis, tripling of the murder rate in New York. Don't tell me that Mayor de Blasio cares about black people because in the tripling of the murder rate in New York nearly, most of the victims are black. Chicago the same. Don't tell me that the mayor and district attorney in Chicago care about blacks, even though they are black, because most of the people being murdered are black. Baltimore the same. Detroit the same. Philadelphia the same. And I don't say this politically, it's simply an observation. There's a breakdown of lawlessness. 
In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we are told that the man of sin will be the anthropon enomon. He'll be lawless, without law, certainly without the law of God, without the Torah. But he will not have the moral law of God. He will seek to be a law unto himself, it says in Daniel. He will seek to change the times and the law. He doesn't have any law. We see society that's lawless. In San Francisco, a refusal, a refusal to prosecute shoplifters. How can somebody run a business when shoplifting is virtually decriminalized? And then businesses leave. City gets destroyed. All in the name of tolerance and wokeness and equality. Honest, hardworking people are driven out of business. Other people have to pay higher prices to compensate for the theft. You can't get insurance. They're destroying themselves with lawlessness. And it's not just the United States. But what's really on back of it is the spirit of Antichrist. Anthropon and nomon, the man of sin. There's more to what you see you see happening on the news than just riots and idiocy. Black lives don't matter to black lives matter. And Antifa, anti-fascist, they are fascist. They're intolerant. They don't believe in free speech or freedom of expression or political freedom. They only believe you can be free if you agree with them. It's all hypocrisy and lies. What they don't realize is they're helping prepare the way for Antichrist. And they're even expediting his arrival. Let's look even further. Much can be said about events in the Middle East, much. But one thing we have to be aware of is something I pointed out on this week in prophecy last week. What is happening in Turkey under Erdogan? He's technically a member of NATO, even though he's hostile to NATO. But he's in a power play against Israel and against the Arab world trying to extend his tentacles economically from Turkey in the eastern Mediterranean against Greece, against Israel's interest, and even trying to outmanipulate or outmaneuver Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, apart from Qatar, who's friendly to him. Now again, we see something. In the constellation of nations against Israel, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it is often pointed out that Turkey is there, but with the exception of Libya, there are no Arab nations. And Erdogan has made major designs and advances into Libya, as well as into Turkey. He's fighting the Kurds, who are friendly to the West and even to Israel. But he's even trying to outpace and out-operate Saudi Arabia, now active in Yemen, where Saudi Arabia is fighting the Houthi rebels. Watch Erdogan. Remember, it was in that region, Pergamum, where Satan's throne is. Now, I don't subscribe to the view held by some of my friends, people I like, such as Joel Richardson, that the Antichrist is going to be Muslim, end of story. I don't take that view. It is impossible to understand Antichrist unless we understand the reconfederation of Europe People like Joel Richardson are right in what they say, mistaken in what they fail to say. 
What Antichrist is going to do, he's going to come in the character of Herod the Great. Again, I'll point you to my book, Shadows of the Beast, and to a forthcoming book I'm planning to write. Herod the Great, to the Romans, he was a Roman. To the Arabs, he was an ethnic Idumean, he was an Arab. And to the Jews, he was a Jew. He's going to be somebody who's a multi-ethnic, multi-religious personality, who's going to bring a false peace to the Middle East by conning everybody. But there is something very significant to what is happening in Turkey. And that's where Pergamum, where Satan's throne is. This, of course, is in some reference to the altar of Zeus, the capstones of which were in Berlin. The gateway to the Iron Curtain and the place where Hitler's Reich came and assumed its headquarters. Much more can be said about this. But the efforts to resurrect the Ottoman Empire are of indeed very important prophetic significance and will become increasingly important in the rise of the Antichrist. Many people believe, many people believe there are two gods and magogs. Obviously the main one must be at the end of the millennial reign of Christ because that's the one the book of Revelation states. But there are reasons to believe there's another one from Ezekiel 38 and 39 that preceded and Turkey is there if you hold that view. Well, let's look just a little bit further concerning this. It was Turkey who shifted the balance of power in the Middle East away from Europe with Salah Hadin's defeat of the Crusades at the Horns of Hattin. And now, having been defeated by Allenby in World War I, Erdogan is trying to reassert what the Ottoman Empire had been. The early church taught that the Apostle John said that the three horns that the Antichrist puts down are Libya, Egypt, and Ethiopia. Turkey has ambitions on all three. We must pray for General Assisi in Egypt. But it is something that is not being adequately recognized in terms not only of its prophetic significance, but its significance for the dawn of Antichrist. Let's continue going further. The new anti-Semitism is traditional anti-Semitism. You see this happening in Europe with the growth of Islam, but even in Germany where the Holocaust took place, a German court, a German judge said that radical Arab Muslims who attacked a Jewish target were acting politically. It was a political crime. It was not an act of anti-Semitic terror. This is Germany. Anti-Semitism showed its head in Britain through the Labour Party. It's here, but now in the United States, you see the people who are in the quartet, so-called in the Congress, with a Alexandra Ortega Cortez, that Presley woman, but also Tliab and Omar, Congresswoman from Venezuela, the Congresswoman from Gaza, and the Congresswoman from Mogadishu. Prominent figures in the Democratic Party, all haters of Israel, and have all been associated with anti-Semitic statements. Ortega, not directly, but certainly supporting the ones who did. 
standing with them. Linda Sarsour and others within the Democratic Party are becoming more and more openly anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish. Now here's the catcher. Daniel tells us something is going to happen. In the book of Daniel, chapter 11, where we read about the coming Antichrist once again, up to verse 36, we have a partial historic fulfillment or historical fulfillment under Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, where Jews such as Menlaus collaborated with him against the Jewish nation. Jews were in bed with this Seleucid, with this Hellenistic pagan who eventually defiled the temple and set up an image of himself giving the Greek god Zeus his own features. Something that's called the abomination of desolation, the Shikutsa Meshomem, that Jesus says must happen again. But from verse 36 onward, it's yet to be fulfilled. It has not happened. It will happen with Antichrist, who will come in the character of Antiochus. Again, I point to my book, Shadows of the Beast, available through Amazon and so forth, or through Moriel. Many will join with them in hypocrisy. There were Jews who joined with the Maccabees hypocritically. They gave lip service to loyalty to the God of Israel and to Israel. But their loyalty was to themselves, and many collaborated. Many collaborated with the enemies of Israel and the Jews. We are seeing something of a schism between diasporic, particularly American Jewry, and Israeli Jewry. Liberal American Jews are increasingly alienating themselves from Israel for the sake of their self-interest. When President Donald Trump relocated the American embassy to Jerusalem, you would think that seated in the front row of the ceremony would be the leaders of the American congressional and senatorial delegation who were Jewish. None of them came. One retired senator, Joseph Lieberman, showed up. Where was Debbie Washerman Schultz? She wasn't there. Where was Charles Schumer? He wasn't there. Where was Adam Schiff? He wasn't there. Where was Senator Blumenthal? He wasn't there. Where was Congressman Jerry Nadler? He wasn't there. Either were other political luminaries of a Jewish background, such as Axelrod, who was the strategist for Barack Obama. They weren't there. The Obama administration knifed Israel in the back over UNESCO. Obama literally lobbied other nations to vote against Israel as one of his final acts as president. Plenty of Jews in bed with him. This kind of betrayal of the Jewish people and of Israel by other Jews is what happened in the days of the Maccabees. It is what happened with Menelaus. It is what happened in Daniel chapter 11. It is what happened in the book of Maccabees, and the book of Daniel tells us it is going to happen again, and it is happening. The same as there were Jews who sided with Antiochus. You've got Jews in the Democratic Party who are siding with the quartet who are removing themselves from Israel. At election time, they will join in hypocrisy. But when you look at their actions and their voting record, they're traitors to the Jewish people. I would say that they're Policies betray the American people 
the impeachment of President Trump on bogus grounds was certainly a betrayal of constitutional principle. Even a prominent liberal Democrat law professor, Alan Dershowitz, knew and said that. No, the Menlau syndrome, the new anti-Semitism, where you have Jews joining the anti-Semites against Jewish interests. Now, frighteningly, it's not just the Jews. You are going to have people who claim to be Christian, and I mean people who claim to be evangelical Christian aligning themselves with the pro-abortion lobby and the pro-homosexual lobby against conservative evangelicals. You will have that, and to a degree, you have it already. But what is on the back of this? It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's setting the stage. It happened with the Maccabees. It happened the first time there was the abomination of desolation. It'll happen again. The inability to bring about a cohesion within the European Union. Brexit was only the beginning. We see what happens in Daniel chapter 2. Verse 33, it's legs of iron, it's feet partially of iron and partially of clay. But iron does not adhere to clay. There will be an absolute desperation in the book of Daniel chapter 2. They will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery concerning Rome, the fourth piece. The Treaty of Rome, of course, establishing the European Union. Yes, Turkey has a role in the advent of Antichrist and his identity. But it's a beast who came from the sea, from the nations of the Mediterranean at large. Let's look at this. Remember, Turkey is a member of the NATO alliance, and it wants to be a member of the European Union. It's being blocked largely by Greece. It wants to be in both camps. There are those who see Turkey as the means by which the West can control the Arab world, making Turkey the policeman of the Arabs as it had been before the First World War. The Ottoman Empire, it could be both European, aligned with Germany, and it could be Middle Eastern. In the first century, it was the Roman province of Asia. That's what we call modern Turkey. Most of modern Turkey is the Roman province of Asia. It was Greek-speaking, and it was very much part of the Greco-Roman world and the Roman Empire. The two are not mutually exclusive. Those who say the Antichrist is going to be European, no, he's going to be Middle Eastern, the two are not mutually exclusive. It is a wrong way of thinking. Both camps are correct in what they say, mistaken in what they fail to say. Separate subject. I only mention in passing a related subject, but not our subject at the moment. What am I saying? I'm saying there will be a desperation to make Europe work. A desperation. This will be fueled not only by national security or European security issues. It will be fueled by immigration issues, the kings of the north and the kings of the south, and it will be fueled by economic desperation. The ramifications of COVID-19 economically are already apparent, but there's more to come. 
No, the decline of the EU, the inability to make the iron stick to the clay. But finally, the eighth sign of Antichrist. If possible, the elect will be deceived. I look what Jesus said in Matthew 24 concerning the deception of the elect. He tells us certain things. He tells us of the abomination. He tells us of the beginning of birth pangs. He tells us of Christians being hated by all nations. He tells us of betrayal within the church. He tells us of many false prophets coming to deceive believers. He tells us of the increase in lawlessness as does 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we've already mentioned. He tells us all these things, including the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. But he says something else. False Christs and false prophets will arise. They will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Hyper-charismatic extremism, which is not charismatic, it is charismania, as we've said, it is what is theologically known as neo-Montanism. Things like the New Apostolic Reformation, things like the Word of Faith money preachers, things like this. These women like Heidi Baker and counterfeit revivals in Pensacola and Toronto, all of these things that have been happening in recent decades coming to some kind of a climax. The Antichrist and false prophet are going to put on a show. Remember, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. We've said this 10,000 times. This is not to deny signs and wonders or gifts of the Spirit, but it is to deny that that's the message of Jesus. Scripturally, these signs follow. His message was never one of miracles or even healings. His message was one of repentance and faith, salvation. The signs follow. When you see people making the signs and wonders the focus, you've got a problem. That is the spirit of Antichrist. But when these false Christs come, even the elect will be deceived. I think of Doreen Virtue. Claims have been saved out of New Age, and she's written four books. The fourth one just having been published. The fourth one published in which she pays tribute to Justin Peters, to Chris Rosebro, to various other figures, Phil Johnson from John MacArthur's ministry. She pays tribute to these people, thanking them for making the book possible and for the impact they've had on her when she claims an uncrucified Jesus with no stigmata, no nail marks appeared to her. She gets baptized by homosexual clergy and says the spirit filled her. And this woman was promoted by Justin Peters. This woman was promoted and defended by Chris Rosebro, who himself has a statue of an uncrucified Christ in his church that he stands before dressed in his Babylonian garments and prays. He prays in front of a graven image of Jesus, also with no nail marks. This was Chris Rosebro. That's right. And Justin Peter says he didn't know it. He didn't know it. Well, then why didn't he issue a statement retracting? When she cites these people in her fourth book, and they knew it ahead of time. Why didn't they issue statements saying, we don't agree with this, but no, they go along with it. Not a word out of Phil Johnson. Not a word out of Justin Peters. Not a word out of Chris Rosebro saying, we don't agree with this. 
Of course, Chris Rosebro said he didn't agree with it, except that he went along with the publication of the fourth book. Did not try to stop it or have his name taken out of it. And he admitted it was from the devil. But it was okay with the book being published and his name being in it. Now, again, a man who says that forgiveness of sins comes by confessing your sins to him and who stands before a graven image and prays to, to, uh, in front of a statue of a Christ with no nail marks. Okay, this man may not be a Christian. I doubt, you know, you, there's no reasonable way you can consider Chris Rosebro by biblical definition to be a Christian. God only knows his heart, but by theological definition, he's not a Christian. You know, it says all kinds of things. He mocks the mark of the beast. He mocks belief in an antichrist. He prays in front of a graven image with no nail marks. And he says sin is forgiven by confessing the sin to him. And he's in ministry with his son. They use four-letter words and vulgarity and all sorts of just unbelievably disgusting things. Okay, him we can say we don't consider him to be a Christian. There's nothing Christian about that guy, except it's his livelihood or something possibly, but that's all. I don't know if he was ever even saved. Certainly he does not teach Christianity now. But Justin Peters? Phil Johnson? Oh, I disagree with them theologically. I disagree with them theologically. But to see them promoting Doreen Virtue? J.D. Hall promoting Doreen Virtue? These are people who claim to be the elect. A woman who has a Christ who was never crucified that appeared to her three-dimensionally? Jesus said, if anybody says I've come to you, don't believe it, I'm coming back the way I went. False Christ will appear. False Christ? You've got people who count themselves among the elect, lending credence to her. And even when they found out what she was doing and teaching, if they didn't know it already, they never issued any statement saying it's wrong. They never said, take my name out of your book. Don't publish it with my name in it. They just went along with it. They defend this. This is a Jezebel spirit. This was a false Christ. This is wrong. But it's setting the stage for anti-Christ. A false Christ is going to appear just like he appeared to Doreen Virtue. And the false prophet will make an image of him just like Chris Rosebro's false image. It's happening. Remember, just as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the world, unbelieving Israel, and the apostate church for the coming of the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ. The spirit of Antichrist is preparing the world, unbelieving Israel, and the apostate church for the coming of the Antichrist. And we see the elect involved with it, at least people who say they are. How could Justin Peters have not said, take my name out of the book, I was wrong publicly? Why didn't he say he was wrong? Why wouldn't he issue a statement? Phil Johnson, no statement. J.D. Hall, defends her. Rosebro says he knows it's of the devil, but he was okay with the fourth book being published, paying thanks and tribute to him. 
course, he's got his own false Christ, the graven image one that he prays in front of in his so-called church. This is wrong. No, friends, these are signs of Antichrist. The elect being deceived. The decline of the EU. This new anti-Semitism in which you have Jews in league with anti-Semites and enemies of Israel in the character of Menlaus in the book of Maccabees as predicted in Daniel. The role that Turkey is now playing in the Middle East. The lawlessness in society preparing the way for the man of lawlessness. The false apostles of the new apostolic reformation including the messianic version of it. The Jezebel spirit, you tolerate the woman Jezebel. The feminism of the world getting into the church. And then this social justice gospel that has no salvation in it. Wokeness, intersectionality, all of these things are signs that the Antichrist is drawing nearer in his manifestation and apparition. He's coming. Doreen Virtue's already seen one. Major evangelical figures laud her and defend her. Even have statues that they pray in front of. Jesus, who was never crucified. False Christ. All of these things. Where does it end? Does it end with the Antichrist? No, it does not end with the Antichrist. It begins with the return of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will destroy the Antichrist and false prophet with the breath of his coming. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.